Being from the South, I know a thing or two about how bugs can ruin a great outdoor experience. It's crazy how something so small can affect some of the potentially greatest experiences of your life. And that's why today's show is brought to you in part by Sawyer. You might know them as the water filter company. I actually have a couple Sawyer filters, but they make a lot of other great products too, including their insect repellent. And uh, j- just some points about what it is. It's great for the whole family. It's actually safe to use on infants and those who are pregnant because they don't use DEET, the active ingredient. They use something better called picaridin. It actually lasts longer. It lasts up to 12 hours pretty incredible and it doesn't damage any of your gear so it's insect repellent specifically made for families who are also outdoorsy because it won't ruin any of that high dollar gear that you've bought to be out there and it does a fantastic job of protecting you and your family from those vector-borne illnesses that are carried by insects i know for me i'm always carrying some insect repellent because i've had mosquitoes specifically ruin some pretty incredible backpacking experiences don't let it happen to you. Use Sawyer's 20% Picaridin insect repellents. Find out more about that at Sawyer.com. Play safe, travel safely. Sawyer, they keep you outdoors. Yeah, like I remember when I first got there, I was like, oh, I'm not sure touring on a bike would be good here and this. But once you get used to it and you know that all the bad news that Africa receives is just because bad news does better on the TV, it's not that dangerous. Yes, there's you know places you've got to be careful and... This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we hear stories of adventure from every corner of the planet. We interview all sorts of folks who are using their sport to explore the world around them and give you the inspiration you need to get out there and have some fun. Hey folks, thanks for joining us today. Uh, We're talking to Simon Blake about cycling in east africa you know it's a it's kind of uh i've been to africa a few times east africa as well a few times and never got to really bike there but boy did it look fun to to get out there it's beautiful so much potential in so many ways and so it's cool to hear from simon who has seen that who's lived there nearly a decade and uh, who was trying his best to introduce gravel riding and cycling in general to the area and kind of like the running world has see the potential in the athletes and just get folks get folks doing adventure sports um so i hope you enjoy listening to simon he's a great storyteller uh has an awesome accent you know and i hope he would say the same thing about me got a pretty cool american accent but he's got a great australian accent and it was great talking to him and you can find him at instagram it's migration underscore gravel underscore race or cycle underscore east africa and i think migration gravel race.com is also his so check all those out Kenyan riders as well, Kenyan underscore riders, but check all that out uh, on ins- Instagram. Get in touch with him if you ever want to do a trip in that area. I know he'd love to have you. Tell him this, the Adventure Sports Podcast uh, sent you, and we would love to hear how uh, how all those worlds cross over. So get out there, have some fun. The world's going to open up at some point, and so start planning your East Africa adventure, and make sure you get in si- touch with Simon when you do. All right, folks, here is the episode. Uh, you know, first of all, welcome to the show. But but you're 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 up early at six thirty a.m. and wh- where are you coming from? Yeah, thank you, Mason. So yeah, talking about uh, cycling in East Africa, and I've been I have been living in Kenya for the past nine years. But at the moment, I'm actually living in the desert in Australia. Came home due to the coronavirus because a lot of the things. I was trying to get going in Africa weren't really possible. You can't have mass gatherings and then tourism had stopped as well. And then big thing that I'm still working on in Australia uh, is a, a migration gravel race that we're putting on just outside the Masai Mara Game Reserve. And it is pretty early in the morning. Sun's just coming up here, top of the Tanami Desert. Yeah, all good. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, absolutely, man. So you say that it was the uh, the coronavirus that that pushed you home. So so how uh, let, you know? Let's go back. You know, it sounds like you know. I'm assuming here, uh, it sounds like you're from Australia. <laughs> if, That's if you're correct. Not, I apologize. Yeah. What uh, how <laughs> what, what what'd you grow up doing, and how'd you end up over in Kenya in the first place? I'd love to hear that story. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. So when I was in high school, I was um, like a relatively good distance runner for, you know, a boy in Sydney and really loved it and then decided uh, I met a coach actually in, in Sydney and he was taking distance runners over to Kenya to train with them and also to try and figure out why were Kenyans so much better than the rest of the world when it came to distance running. And so I was like, yeah, great. I'd love to go over. I just finished school. I was at college doing graphic design. And then I was like, yeah, cool. And so I went over with him. And we just sort of traveled around, trained with different people, met different people. And it was awesome. Like I think I was 19 years of age when that happened. I loved it. And it was just such an adventure. And it was pretty wild. And we didn't do the normal touristy things. We actually went and visited a lot of athletes. We stayed in some pretty rough places, but we were always welcome. And it was pretty cool. Then many, many years of actually going back to help out with distance running training camps, mainly in Kenya, but also a little bit in Zimbabwe uh, until Zim sort of got, yeah, politically got a little bit unstable. And so we had to sort of stop going there. But yeah, kept going to Kenya, um, helping out with distance running camps. And we helped uh, Brother Colm. Not sure if, uh, if anyone's ever heard of him before, but he's sort of, He's one of the guys that made Kenya what it is when it comes to distance running. So he originally started a, a female, a junior female training camp, and then a lot of the boys kept bugging him, saying, "Oh, I want to come, I want to come." And he ends up now having coached David Rudisha. I think it's over more than thirty world champions to his name. Um, phenomenal, and he's just a seriously down to earth, pretty cool um, old Eng um, Irish guy. So I was helping out with those camps, but then my running, I wasn't running as fast as I ever hoped I'd run one day, especially when you go to Kenya, you realize you're not very good. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and uh, so came back to Australia, like I was coming, but I was generally go for a couple of weeks or a couple of months at a time back then. And then came back and mainly started to work in the outdoors. And that was where I think I'd been always riding a mountain bike as a child or as a BMX, but then got into mountain biking in a much bigger way. Yeah, it sort of took off from there. So I started riding a lot more and then left a job in Australia in the outdoors that I was really enjoying but wanted to move on and do other things. And at exactly the same time, ran into my running coach and he was like, oh, look, I've met this guy. He was the running coach is now living in Kenya, coaching runners, and told me that he'd met um, this guy who'd started up a cycling team uh, up in Iten, which is the it's the main running town in Kenya. So the main distance runners come from, um, well, not really from Iten. Some do, but they all gravitate towards Iten. It's sort of, I feel in some ways it's like a university or, or a ski town where people come from everywhere else, but they all come here and end up living there and develop what they're doing. And it's pretty cool. Um, and it's not unusual to wake up in the morning and see the current world record holder for a whole number of different uh, events running down the road. And, and people don't really just go for a jog there. Everyone's like moving. It's quite impressive. Um, well, wow. one of those places you kind of have to keep your head low because everyone else <laughs> is right. just more impressive. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And like, there's a, it's funny, like you're seeing, which is a Mzungu is what they call a white man over there in, mm -hmm. in Swahili. And so you're expected to be hopeless. Like it's just, ah, Mazungu, you are trying. Ah, Mazungu, you have tried. And it just sort of essentially means like you're pretty slow, but, you know, keep having a go. But you'll never beat us, folk. And, <laughs> but um, there's a few white boys that have gone over and have done really well and have mixed it um, with the Kenyans, which is seriously impressive, um, especially on their own home turf. But <clears throat> it's pretty rare. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an amazing little town, it's stunningly beautiful, um, scenery wise, cause it's on, it's a true, the, on top of a tributary into the Great Rift Valley, which is the Kerio Valley. So there's lots of elevation to lose for, which is very good for mountain biking, it goes from about 12 or 2,300 meters down to about 1,100 meters. So you lose about 1,200 meters vertical from your 10, essentially down two hills. So it goes down, flattens out a little and drops again. So I have developed trails down there. We ran in enduro for the past, I think, three years. Uh, the first year 
was super low entrance. It was essentially one of my mates from Uganda came over and then a friend from America was actually in Kenya. Uh, we were, he'd come over just for a break and so I put the enduro on then and so that was essentially us three. Um, but then last year I ran the enduro at this time of year actually and um, we had seven, no, 18 entrants and it was, yeah, it was fantastic. It was a really cool event. Um it was a lot of the boys from the cycling team helped out. They made it a lot easier on me. And um, the county got involved a little bit, which was really cool. And then, mm-hmm. yeah, we camped one night down by the Kerio River and then just rode a lot of rough sort of really natural trails, which is I think is how I prefer to ride anyway. Yeah, it was great. Some of the trails were pretty long. Like one of the stages could be five and a half kilometres long, but I split it in half just so that there's an amazing lookout at halfway. So I thought, well, might as well just stop the stage there. Everyone can relax, have some food. Uh, it's in the middle of the bush down this hill and then keep going for the second stage. So one day I'd like to go back and, and kick off the Kerio Valley Enduro again, but we'll, we'll see what the world does over the next few years. No, absolutely. I mean, wow, you just shared so much. So originally <laughs> it was running that brought you over That's there. right. And, yeah. you know, that, that transition into cycling, you know, obviously there's, there's so much talent. There's, I mean, Africa is such a huge continent. Uh, you know, there's always just these incredible athletes out there, you know, in, in all sorts of sports. Do you, do you feel that's uh, kind of similar to running, what happened with running and just seeing how Kenyans have done specifically in, in some other surrounding countries? Do you think that's kind of similar with the cycling world as well? Like it's, in a lot of ways, untapped the first of all the landscape for for the ability to mountain bike, just some incredible routes, but also athletes. Yeah, hundred percent. So, and then yeah, so the next bit to why I ended up in Kenya with a cycling team was there yeah, had, had had met my old running coach again, actually back in Australia. We just caught up one day. This is after years of him being in Kenya. I was working in the outdoors in Australia, and then we just caught up. And he's like, oh, I've met this guy who started a bike team up in E10. I was like, yeah, wow, that's – actually, initially, I thought it was pretty mad. I was like, what? A guy starting a bike team in Kenya, like road cycling? Like, you've got to be crazy. And um, But he's explained it to me more, and he's like, they're pretty amazing going uphill, you know, really high power-to-weight ratio. Um, but they don't descend too well. They crash quite often. Their skills aren't too good. And I'd actually written up some really, really basic um, stuff for the outdoor. I was working for an outdoor egg company and like, you know, the three points of cornering, the three points of going downhill, three points for going off a small drop. And so I shared that with the old running coach and he took that back to the guy that started the bike team in Kenya a couple of weeks later. And then a couple of phone calls, a couple of Skype meetings, a couple of um, emails. And then I was at the time actually doing freelance outdoor work. So I wasn't held down to anything and they're like, why don't you come help out? And I was like, yeah, why not? Like if it doesn't work, you know, I'm lucky. I come from a country where I can essentially just get onto an airplane, turn up. Oh, yes, sir. Here's your visa. Welcome. And um, it's flexible. If I don't like it, I can fly back home. So that's what I did and then enjoyed it enough to stay. And then nine years later, I had to leave reluctantly because of um, coronavirus. Um, but yeah, still got a lot of links. I'm still talking to a lot of people back in Africa about organizing events. And, um, I'd started, that was one of the things I was moving into more was event organization. So obviously the migration gravel race would be one of the biggest, but the carrier value enduro. And then I was sort of running a whole East African enduro series with mates. So everyone was essentially putting on their own race in different parts of Kenya. Um, but I essentially was probably the glue that was holding it all together. Um, did a lot of the artwork and promoted it. And, and if anyone needed a hand, then I could at least tell them my experiences of organizing enduro events in East Africa, which is a little different to other enduro events I've done around the world. Um, it just, yeah. And for, yeah, like for safety, for, um, we try and keep our events together. So like I know I did a really great event up in Whitehorse in Canada years ago and you turn up, you get a little chip, 
you go with your mate, you ride the whole course, you come hand your chip back in, it prints out the results for you. And it was an amazing day. Like, I absolutely loved it. I thought it was a really cool event. Um, up in, it was actually up in Car Cross, just out of Whitehorse. But we feel in Kenya, because there could be animals out there, um, not so much in some parts of, of Kenya. There's a lot, all the, like the safari animals aren't around. It's more domesticated animals, cows, sheep, and goats. Um, but just the fact if you were to come off your bike in even parts of where I ran my events and hurt yourself, you'd be in quite a lot of trouble. Like, there's not a great way to get out. There's not a great ambulance system. The medical system is not as good as Canada or Australia or Europe. So we were sort of looking after each other. So, and it was a really cool way that you'd, you'd finish the event. Yes, you had to wait, but that's why I put the, the stages in a beautiful location so you had something to look at. Um, and then just hang out and with the other guys. Everyone comes and finishes. It made a really cool vibe because everyone's like cheering each other on and, and then laughing at everyone else's reactions as they cross the line and speak about that one bit of trail or that nasty climb or whatever it was. Um, and then we'd move on as like a you know a weekend group ride to the beginning of the next stage and then off we go again. And I felt it's a really, really social way to essentially race your bike. You're not, you know, flogging yourself like a cross-country race. Um, and then I'd started organising a Criterium series in Kenya as well, which was pretty amazing right from the first race, which you organised through probably the biggest shopping mall in Nairobi, which is the capital city of Kenya. Uh, so the shopping mall is called Two Rivers Mall because two rivers, two rivers sorry, meet at one location where the mall is. And they've got some grand plans for a sort of a big, um, obviously a really big shopping mall, but a whole lot of real estate as well. So a lot of roads have been built, but they've got nothing around the roads yet. So we're allowed to use these roads essentially 100% closed to traffic, which is also an issue in Kenya, um, that the traffic safety or, or driving safety is a little bit different, especially to where I grew up in Australia. Um, and it's really unfortunate that every now and then guys around the world get you know hit by cars, but it's a little bit too common, I'd say, in Kenya. So I thought if I can organise a race that's off main roads and, and we essentially have control of the road ourselves through the mall security, um, and it went really well. We you know got some music going and I was commentating with two other local guys and it was an absolute hit. Like it went really, really well. It was much better than I expected it to go. and. That kicked off to another criterion that some other mates were organising, and um, actually <laughs> the first the first negative effect for me for the coronavirus is the second uh, edition of this criterion. I remember I was at the mall, setting up the course, barricading off sections, getting everything ready, getting gates opened, and then I got a call from one of the guys I was working with. He runs a company called Swim Africa doing a lot of um, swimming coaching, James Miruri is his name. And then he rang me and said, look, I'm just at this meeting with some quite official people of the area and we're being told that no mass gatherings are allowed to happen starting today. And I was like, dude, it's Friday. The race is on Saturday. Can't they just wait till Monday? Like, Come on, <laughs> let's get this event done. And, and it never happened. So we had to can it and the yeah, the cycling community was quite disappointed and um, I know racing is just kicking off again in Kenya, so I've seen a few things like social media. It sounds like your your passion is for planning planning the events themselves, putting the events on themselves. I suppose so, yeah. It was something, like I never thought, like, oh, I want to be a race organizer. Like, I always thought that actually be horrible. Right, right. That sounds really tough, especially in another country, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, print all this stuff out and you've got to be organized, you've got to have spreadsheets and then <laughs> and deal with the county, deal with the police, which is in Kenya unfortunately not easy to do. But in the end, yeah, it was great. Like when it works, it's phenomenal. And it was mainly like that first enduro I held, it was just me and two mates just letting loose on some trails and I'd pushed it to get people involved. I think everyone was either a bit scared because – I'm not – like I come back to Australia and I ride with mates and I get seriously schooled on enduro mountain biking. Like some of my mates, it's just phenomenal. But that's the scene. They've got really nice bikes, you know, long travel. 
not that I didn't have nice bikes, but I'd say Australia is a little bit ahead of the curve. And and then there's just so many more guys riding. So I think all of that just pushes everyone and you just get a lot better. I was actually listening to a podcast of yours last night on the guys that have got those magnetic pedals. And that's exactly what they were saying. It's just ride with people that are better than you and you get better. Um, mm-hmm. and I think um, so in Africa as well, like it is that starting to happen. Like, I wouldn't say I'm a fantastic rider, but last year I won the East African Enduro Series. But there's a lot of guys that like two years ago were coming along and awesome guys, um, but they were pretty slow. But this year, like I'm seeing them putting up some results. And I was like, wow, he's really starting to move. Like, damn, if I don't get back to Africa soon, I'm never going to beat him ever again. And it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> like even, I was an event on just before I left up in the Ngong Hills, no, in Kajabi, sorry. There's a, Kajabi's a small town an hour out of Nairobi. And there's a, a young guy that I've known for a couple of years. Um, yeah, I'd never, he's never, ever troubled me. Like, I was like, yeah, Shabazz, he's there, cool, whatever. And then at the Kajabi in Jura, he thrashed me. And I was like, that is so awesome. Like, these young guys, are, they're really getting into it. They're getting quite jazzed about their mountain biking and, they're starting to fly. Like, so it was like, oh, that's cool. You know, what have I created? But yeah, there's a lot of other guys now doing it, organizing events, putting stuff on, organizing weekend rides. At, and that's the cool thing. Yeah, like they've got, you know, easy dirt road rides now. They've got gentle single track rides. They've got guys that like doing more endurance, you know, riding their bike for most of the day, putting in huge kilometers. Uh, there's guys that are, now looking for more of the enduro scene type riding so it's quite varied as to the types of riding people are doing and different groups popping up all the time so africa is embracing cycling um and i'd say it's probably economically the i think the middle class of africa or east africa is growing and so people do have especially in the big cities have a little bit of disposable money now um they might have sort of like what we would term as a proper job so they're often inside or you know at meetings or at a computer or on the phone so i think on the weekend they want to get out and and blow some of that steam and and just ride their bike and see part of their own country especially for east africa i actually think the bike is one of the best ways to see the country itself and um even bike packing trips i've done there are definitely better than any well i've done a few bikepacking trips that involve seeing some animals as well which is just mind-blowing do feel like you're a little bit of the food chain again but it's just it's amazing like but then get riding in other areas so north of e10 where i live the beginning of the cherangani hills and they go much further north up into what is known as pakot land so the different tribes uh, it starts in Marraquet, or I'll go Marraquet land and moves up Pakot, and it's getting sort of getting pretty remote once you hit the area of, of the Pakot. And um, but the riding up there is just stunning. So yeah, like I remember when I first got there, I was like, oh, I'm not sure that like touring on a bike would be good here and this. But once you get used to it, and you know that all the bad news that Africa receives is just because bad news does better on the TV. It's not that dangerous yes there's you know places you've got to be careful and don't do this don't do that but especially out in the rural areas i think i've only really had one bad moment out in the rural areas and it was a bad moment but it was once in nine years but other than that like i felt very safe the people are very inquisitive you get yelled at a million times how are you mzungu especially from the young kids which is quite hilarious at times i remember a bike packing trip actually this has happened many times just riding down the road, me and a mate, and you know, especially on the uphills, you're going pretty slowly. And then some small child at a school in the playground at recess or lunch will see you. And they don't see many white guys on bikes out there, so you are quite a novelty. And he'll just scream, Mazungu, how are you? And then he will run down through the, the school field over to where you are. And then obviously all of his mates hear him, so then they all look up and scream out the same thing and they'll run over. And all of a sudden you have the entire school running over to the fence where you are just screaming at you. Mzungu, how are you? Mzungu, how are you? Mzungu, how are you? 
and they just go absolutely wild and they start clapping and cheering you know, dude i'm pretty slow actually but <laughs> you can clap you and like cheer all you want so. that's right yeah i'll sign autographs just here and it's hilarious so and then sometimes we'll stop and interact with the kids and sometimes just keep riding on but um yeah it's it's a really cool spot to to ride your bike and that was something i was going to move into more was more bike tourism um uh, bike packing trips and then you know moving from point to point uh and then other sort of more cross country or enduro mountain bike trips as well or you might stay in one place and and ride then shuttle out to a different area and then ride so it was more about the descending and and less about the um the traveling in a sense and then we were lucky enough to run a a trip for Rafa travel sort of through part of Kenya not all of it but if it was an 8 day ride uh ended up at the Masai Mara and yeah it was great and the clients had a good time and so we were able to yeah we were able to set up the trip for a clientele that rides for Rafa so i know initially the route was sort of planned about where can we find nice hotels um and so we spoke a long time which part of Kenya should we ride in and and then we tried to choose a good hotel to another good hotel that was somewhere between 100 to 200k a day and a mixture of tarmac or dirt roads um yeah there was only one day we had to shuttle in the vehicles a little bit because we'd had some horrendous rain overnight and the the red dirt roads or murram roads as they call them in Kenya can get pretty bad when it's really muddy um and just clients were slipping over everywhere and that the mud sort of cakes up on your tires and just gets stuck in the frame and you literally can't even push your bike you have to shoulder the bike and start walking and so we thought well this is not very enjoyable and um so threw everyone in the car and the four wheel drives and got to a bit that hadn't been raining and then progressed on and that was yeah that was the day before we got to the Masai Mara um and then ended up in the mara did a safari drive that night which was pretty amazing watch the sun go down lots of animals and the safari company you know brought out drinks and it's all quite lardy da and i think it was part of that and a whole number of other reasons that got us excited about organizing a gravel race in in kenya and um it's actually through a mate who's and a lawyer, he's an American guy, but a lawyer in in the Netherlands, uh, runs a bike shop called Lola Bikes and Coffee, uh, and has now started up sort of like a, a high quality amateur cycling team in uh, the Netherlands, in the Hague, called Team Armani, and they have links through the coffee shop with uh, coffee beans coming from Africa. Um, but he'd also seen on his travels to Africa that again he'd seen the talent that was available, or that was that's present in Africa, and it's like, wow, what if is there a possibility of giving these guys opportunities? Then it was on the we just spoke. I just spoke about cycling in East Africa and told him pretty much everything that I'd experienced over by then must have been about eight years and this that blah blah, blah and and what what I felt East Africa needed like why do you turn on the the television to watch the olympics and every middle distance race is owned by a black east african athlete either ethiopian now even ugandan which is fantastic to see sometimes an eritrean but mainly a kenyan you turn on the marathons london rotterdam oslo all the big ones even the dubai marathon and it's owned again by a kenyan or an ethiopian so as well, the talent is just glaringly obvious that endurance talent athletes out of East Africa are just a, they're a cut above the rest and it's the odd Wazungu white man that comes along like Tita Bauman or even these two twins Zach I mean Zane and Jake that are living in E10 at the moment Robinson brothers that are running like sub 60 half marathons there's another young guy Julian who's also running some seriously fast times I think he's Austrian but you know I've just named them and I can remember all of them but the Kenyans is, there's just lists and lists and lists of seriously fast men coming out of E10 and that region, which is sort of Elgar, Marikwet, the Nandi. Uh, it's generally one tribe, generally, the Kalenjin. But um, since 
other tribes in Kenya have seen the Kalenjin being so successful. They've in some ways taught themselves to run as well. So the Kikuyu, the Maasai, uh, some Kamba, um, but it's generally your Kalenjin that, that win most of the big races. Speaking to Michael from Team Armani and Lola Bikes, it was like, well, you know, what can we do? And then it was like, well, what can we do to get a spotlight on on Kenya for cycling? And what can we do to excite people? And and what does Kenya have that the rest of the world doesn't have? Um, you know, there's beautiful mountains in the Alps in France. There's amazing mountains in the Rockies in Canada and, and the Sawtooth Mountains in the USA and the Idaho. So it's like, Yes, there's mountains in Kenya and they are beautiful, but why would you travel all over the world when you, most people have them in their backyard? And we're like, well, they don't have this scenery with animals in it. And so we thought if we can have a race next to one of the world's biggest game reserves and the most popular game parks, but keeping it essentially at a safe enough distance, um, which has been right from the beginning. It's like, yes, we want people to see the animals, but we don't want them to essentially meet the animals um so we've we've put on this this event and it's probably going to be a four day um yeah four day race over 650 kilometers uh, we want it to be brutally hard um, and it seems to be that the the big gravel races now are very very hard races they're quite a test um something we've been looking at is like the atlas mountain race and obviously dirty kenza and leadville 100 and you know they're not easy events and for I think your average cyclist just to finish the race is is the prize. Like that's um, that's what you get happy about. But the guys that are winning it are still seriously flying. Is this the migration that I was reading about? Yep. So that'd be the migration gravel race, and it's all of us. So it's myself, Michael, another guy in the Netherlands, and then a mate of mine, James, in Kenya, who runs a outdoor adventure company called Savage Wilderness. Um, so he's doing most of logistics on the ground at the moment because he's still in Kenya uh, and he's worked in the outdoors, run an outdoor company for many, many years. So luckily he has all the logistics, the vehicles, the, the contacts, the knowledge. Uh, he's been to the Mara many, many times. So, yeah, we feel we've pretty much plotted the route now, 650K, and it must have taken – it's taken a lot of reckeys to get <laughs> get it done. But we feel for a lot of races, guys ride through the night. Uh, I know a lot of these sort of like bike packing slash gravel events, you know, it's like, right, start here and, and you can finish there. Uh, and it's sort of – you've got these checkpoints you have to check into on the way, but you, do, you can sleep as much or as little as you want. But we feel that it won't be safe if we tried to go with that tactic in Kenya. Um, sometimes you know you meet the wrong people at night time in Africa and then also just animals um, and a lot of them a lot of them do feed at night time so we thought if we can get people off off their bikes and off the road but essentially uh, during the night and then we keep it safe so we'll start and finish at a quite a nice probably yeah called like a, a game lodge whatever it's just it's he's got the super fancy part but he's also got a just a very comfortable basic section called Barnders in the Wild on the edge of the Masai Mara and one of the conservancies. So we'll start and finish the race there. That'll be essentially race village. Yeah, it's pretty spectacular riding. We ride through conservancies where you do see animals. Some of those roads are pretty rough. Some of them are super smooth. And then we go in between sort of, sort of game reserve, safari park sort of area or conservancies. And then we hook up into some more rural, like current African rural life through villages. And so it's sort of in and out of that, some pretty wild places as well. So I feel it's a really, you get sort of a good mix of the animals and then current African life. And most of the roads there are red dirt. And some of those red dirt roads are so smooth, like you just, you're flying, going so fast, especially with the riding with a mate or working together and you know, up through the African bush, but then other parts you wish you had almost a dual suspension mountain bike. Like it's pretty rough roads. There's lots of ruts and really rocky. Um, sometimes the the roads are built there with a nice red soil, but because in the wet season they get so muddy, then the council goes around and purposely throws rock into the road, which is what they call the murram. 
and some of those mowing roads can be rough, like really, really rough. So when I was riding there, the last recce, I actually did a recce there just before I came home. I was riding a 40 mil tyre on the rear and actually a 2.1 tyre on the front on a rigid um, gravel bike. Uh, I just felt having that 2.1 tyre up front was a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more traction on some of the corners, but the, having the, the 40 mil out the back was, you know, wasn't slowing me down too much. Yeah, it's not a safari trip. It is a real race, but we're happy for people to come and, and just survive as well and just finish. But, but yeah, so tyre tie choice is actually going to be quite key, I think. That is fascinating. How, how many people are you expecting to sign up for the migration? And, and, and when is it taking place? You might have mentioned, but I, I didn't catch it. No, that's cool. Yes, I haven't mentioned that yet. So the date that we're aiming for in a corona world <laughs> is the 20th to the 23rd of January 2021. So we're sort of aiming for around 50. We don't want to go too big on the first one. We really want to do quite a good job. We want to all the bells and whistles and make sure the logistics is right and we want to make sure that it is a good event and then each year slowly grow it and and in you know organically whatever it is try and let the event just grow itself i think if we feel in some ways if we try and be i don't know greedy uh the first year and get too many people involved then it could actually you know we might miss things even though we've been doing this for a long time with james is outdoors i've been organizing events in kenya um so has james and then michael's been heavily involved in the cycling scene in Europe for a long, long time. We're all coming together and it's a new thing in Africa and it's just Africa time and, and just things that just happen in Africa at times that slow you down. Probably, not probably actually, we will have a bunch of local Maasai guys. So this part of Kenya is Maasai land, the Maasai Mara National Park. So the tribe that live in that area is the Maasai. Um, and we'll work with, we're already working with a number of the Maasai guys down there as sort of fixes and they know this guy who knows that guy and this land and, and whatever it is. But we'll also work with some of the young Maasai guys, get them on what they call boda boda, which comes from the term border to border. So if you're at some of the big um, border posts in Africa, uh, especially back in the day, you would get to one border, get your passport signed, you'd have to walk quite a distance across no man's land, get to the next one, stamp your passport, and then off you go into the new into the new country so often it used to be bicycles and you would get to the first checkpoint stamp your passport and then there'd be all these young guys on bikes and that's where it came boda boda and so you would jump on from border to border get a little bike ride across make it faster get your next passport stamp and off you go and so now everything that's sort of a bicycle taxi or a motorbike taxi has become known as a boda boda um, so we'll use these boda boda guys to some of the corridors that we feel have probably a few too many animals or there could be an opportunity that we will be escorted by Maasai guys on motorbikes through these areas. So even if you come through alone or you come through in a small group, we'll have enough of them there that they'll just keep shuttling people through. You know, it might be like a one kilometre section or a 2K section of we know there's animals around. Um, we've got really good links through the guys at the Conservancy and the sort of the Maasai fixes that we know where the animals are at certain times. Well, there's an elephant in this region and they're moving in that direction for this reason. We've got a pride of lion has been spotted over here the last couple of days or there's a whole lot of wildebeest or zebra or giraffe, whatever it is. And so it might just be that they can let people know and you can, if you're not seriously racing hard, you can stop, pull out your camera and, and have some photos or just enjoy seeing African wildlife in the African wild. If you have to stop for a little bit because an elephant's crossing the road, then you have to stop. That's part of the race. Um, but these guys, they that's where they live. It's where they That's how they travel each day on these boater boater motorbikes. And, um, yeah, they know what they're doing. So just a different way of, again, trying to hook into the community and, and work with the local community, which is, yeah, a lot of those guys are struggling quite a bit at the moment with coronavirus. Um, it's not really, for a lot of East African guys, you can't really work from home. They don't have an office with a computer and blah, blah. <laughs> they sell fruit on the side of the road or they have their cows or whatever it is and they've got to travel into town to, to sell whatever it is. So I know 
initially when coronavirus hit and a lot of the lockdown rules were being implemented into East Africa, there was actually a lot of talk that should lockdown restrictions happen in East Africa because so many people are going to be unemployed essentially overnight. And then when they go home, they're often from large families or a community where there's a lot of people in a small area. So there's not going to be a lot of social distancing anyway. Um, And then will that huge spike in unemployment then create other issues like, you know, people not eating and then turning to crime and blah, blah. So I think it's been, yeah, very different for a lot of those nations, different to how Australia run it or America or New Zealand or whatever it is. Um, like I know every country is putting their own, own twist on it, but I think it had to be done differently in Africa because of the environment and the way people live and the current economic situation but it seems from what i'm hearing that the the virus is slowing down in east africa which is fantastic but yeah from what i'm hearing they're starting to try and open up tourism again because that's such a it's such a big business in east africa and a lot of people survive off off tourism so hopefully they can open it up and people can start working again so that's yeah tapping into that with the migration gravel race but also we think that the rest of the world is just loving that type of cycling obviously and race format at the moment and we thought why not show off kenya and 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 introduce it into africa but then also having worked for a bike team for nine years and and, you know getting to know the guys and living with them and traveling with them around the world to races um it's like within the team ourselves as the, the coaching management staff i might take a bunch of four to six guys to Europe to race and it's a different culture it's a different many many things and so a few of them especially initially will not do well at all just everything's different uh, and then a few of them will, will sort of get a good idea and then they'll they'll start to race okay and then some of them do well and some of them don't and then some of them never really get it and unfortunately we have to take them to Europe to figure that out you can't just figure it out in Kenya but at the same time that's a lot of money uh, and so a lot of the funding for the team was essentially just like, damn, that didn't work with that athlete and uh, what do we do? And it just costs a lot of money and that's just part of it. But it was always something that can we reverse that situation in a way is bring top quality athletes into Kenya and then are more Kenyans able to experience how fast a guy from Belgium is in a criterium through corners or... You know, how fast can these guys ride on gravel for multiple Ks every single day for a four-day race? So part of it is, is yeah, showing off Kenya, but then also can we expose the Kenyan guys by bringing talent into Kenya? And we're working out ways of getting, especially some of the Kenyan riders will definitely be involved in the race, some of our best guys. We've currently got three of them signed to a continental team in Germany. So they're pretty good cyclists, right? they're very fast and they're strong and they understand racing. Uh, they haven't really raced gravel before. They do a lot of training on gravel roads, um, but they've never raced. But they're all, I know, speaking to them, even the last couple of weeks, they're pretty excited about the opportunity of racing gravel against some either really, really good amateurs or maybe hopefully some ex-pros. Um, and then slowly growing that, that we can get more and more East Africans into that race. Um, and so, you know, it, it just, there was, um, yeah, I think there was a, a story that the guy that started, Nicholas Leong, he was the guy that started the Kenyan riders cycling team. We used to talk often that Kenyans weren't always the best distance runners. You know, Herb Elliott, Percy Serity, even Flying Finns. It was a whole lot of guys from New Zealand. Like there was even the Americans and another Aussie guy, Ron Clark, you know, All white guys were running seriously fast, 10Ks, marathons, 5,000, 1,500. Um, And then slowly Kenya started to come in, but still they weren't really any good. And there's a story of this guy called Neftili Tamu who was in, I think, the 10,000 metres, and he got lapped, and off he go. And he was just an unknown guy that got lapped in the race, some hopeless runner. The next Olympics, he came back and he won the gold medal. Like, how many people go to the Olympics, get lapped, and then the next time, like, oh, go and win gold? It's like, that doesn't happen. And so, did I, 
off my own opinion, I don't think that guy got, you know, much more talented. It was just that in that Olympics, he was exposed to how fast fast is. And he's like, ah, oh, okay. So when you, oh, okay, yes, okay, they do run. Okay, they're very fast, my friend. Yes, okay. And, and so he went home and either stepped up his training or whatever it was, and, and then he comes back and wins gold. Like, that's a massive step. So we do, we feel like competitively, is that where Kenyan cycling is at the moment? Like, we just need, like everyone, Jock Boyer, um, who first American to ride the Tour de France, I think he's won the race across America a few times. He was in Rwanda for 10 years with um, Team Rwanda and the Africa Rising Centre. And he was saying, even more than me, that they just need exposure to proper racing. Um, and, he, and Jock was a very, very big part of the Tour de Rwanda, which I'd actually say is probably the best road race in the entire world. Um, but it's probably definitely one of the biggest in Africa. Um, and it's a phenomenal eight-day race around Rwanda itself. Um, really good for the, the country and the people just go wild. They absolutely love the race. Uh, Rwanda as a country is very, very hilly. So it's definitely a climber's race. Um, and it's been awesome that a lot of European teams are traveling to the Tour of Rwanda now, especially for Rwanda itself. There's a lot of little Rwandan kids standing on the side of the road who want Balans to win. They want Bosco to win, whoever it is, the, the, the Rwandan champions. But they're seeing all these pro-European guys and, and just, they go wild. It's similar to that story I told about the, the kids at school. They just run to the road and they're just screaming at the cyclists as they come past. And I'd imagine that all those little kids are like, I want to be that guy. I want to have that fancy Lycra on. Mm. I want that beautiful bike. And like, there goes the talent identification and <laughs> development program. It's like if you can get that many thousands of kids just like, I want to be that guy. It's like you're at least half the way there, I'm sure. And like then you've got to source bikes and a training program and how to keep them training and blah, 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 blah. But if the want, if that will is there. So, you know, if Rwanda can keep its act together for the next 10 to 15 years and those 5 to 13-year-old boys start growing up and want to be that guy, then, you know, cycling world, look out. There's going to be a lot of very fast people so um in kenya it's very very different uh even though we're essentially neighbors it's only uganda in between kenya and, and rwanda but i feel the way cycling is growing in kenya is 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 quite different to rwanda rwanda is a little bit more controlled uh, a little bit more involvement from the government which i think is doing a pretty good job at least with the cycling there um they did have some issues and just over a year ago, the president had to leave from doing some silly things. But at the same time, probably run a little bit in like there. Yeah, they've got a proper team there, sponsored by a beer company, and but uh, it's yeah, it's just a bit different. It's sort of it's probably a little bit more controlled in Rwanda. But whereas in Kenya, I feel that it's yes, people like the Kenyan riders. Obviously, where it must have been a big part of the push for cycling. And getting guys overseas was was getting, you know, your average Kenyan quite excited that there was a Kenyan going overseas and racing and occasionally doing well and got a bit of name for himself. But right now, especially that this growth is happening, it's like the people are running Kenyan cycling. It's sort of it's taking off all by itself and they're coming up with their own versions of races or how to run a TT or a Criterium or even the Enduros. Like I was saying, we do it a little bit differently for a number of reasons because of the environment. And But I feel the, the people are running cycling in Kenya and all the best races in Kenya all run by privates that try and get some type of corporate support. Um yeah, but now, luckily, slowly, some Kenyan companies are getting on board. Um, there's a guy who's actually opened a bike shop. He's the distributor for Giant for East Africa now, which is, that's a massive step forward as well now that like real bikes, brand new, are in Kenya and they're being serviced properly. They've got warranties. So, yeah, you can go and get you know, any any giant bike you want now, uh, brand new in Nairobi, and he's, um, it's being done that 
the bike shop's doing it, that it is relatively competitive, especially if you're living in Kenya and you want to ship something in, you've always got to go through the shipping and then this company and that. And uh, it ends up costing a bit of money on top of the original purchase. Um, so the bike shop in Nairobi has been quite competitive and a lot of guys are doing their research online, you know, chain reaction cycles, get it sent to a friend in the UK. That friend comes out, sticks it in his suitcase or get a courier company to bring it in and there's a whole lot of hassles there or the bike shop's already got the bike in Kenya and it's the same or even a little bit less once you add everything up. So it's fantastic to see that shop doing well and people supporting it because he's been supporting all, pretty much, well not all, but most of the bike races, um, which has been yeah really cool that there is a bike shop now supporting cycling events in Kenya. Um, and I'm sure, I really hope that he's doing well for his business. Um, but like I was chatting to him just the other day and he said the cycling business in East Africa at the moment is very, very good, um, even with coronavirus. And I think I've heard that a lot of people are buying bikes around the world because of the virus, but um, apparently the East African market is just booming. And I think it's yeah partly the coronavirus, partly people are realizing that it's a great way to exercise. It's a bit better for the knees for an older person um, than running is. Definitely. And, um, it's a great way to see Kenya. You can get out into the rural areas quite easy, but you can still interact with the local people because like they say, you're not in a box, so you're not in the car, you're not going too fast. You can stop, have a chat. And a lot of the WhatsApp groups in Kenya, it's quite funny. There's little – everyone takes photos of the chai and chapatis or mandazi or some potato and beans. And it's just the thing that happens, like everyone's got their favorite little dukkha, which is like a shop in Kenya. Um, it's like, ah, the chapo and chai here, this is one is the best. Ah, no, my friend, this one is the best. And this is they prepare the chapo like this. Ah, and this. And so often the WhatsApp groups on the weekend have – a variety of photos of chapatis and chai. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome that you can go out for a ride often. Uh, and even these bike packing trips I've done, we'd be riding and riding and riding and like pretty remote areas and get to a little spot. And I was like, Oh, do you have any bottled water? I'm like, Oh, my friend, Hapana. no, 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 we do not have. And it's like, Oh, do you have chai? Ah, Dio, we have, we have, you come. And, <laughs> So, you know, the water's been boiled to make the chai and the milk's been boiled so you know that it's healthy. Um, there's a little bit too much sugar in, <laughs> in the drinks that often, but it's yeah. like, oh, well, that's right. And, you know, I'm riding my bike. I've been riding hard. I'm going to keep riding hard, so that sugar's going to be gobbled up pretty soon anyway. Uh, and then some chapatis and maybe some bananas, and it's all there. It's all fresh, and it costs, you know, 50 cents. You are like, this is terrific. Um, often just carry like a jar of peanut butter with you and then spice up your your chapatis every now and then and so it's yeah that like it, it makes it just easy like once you figure out the 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 I wouldn't call it a system but your way you figure out how the environment works and it's like wow I can just go for a ride and there was always soda like every shop in Kenya sells soda which I think is not good but at the same time if you're bonking and you're out in the middle of nowhere and you pop up a little dukkah and like, ah, oh, have soda, please, and Fanta, Coke. There's a whole variation of different sodas in Kenya. Yeah, so there's all these little shops out in the middle of nowhere um, or even just buying fruit, avocados, really nice bananas, mangoes, pawpaw. Um, so, yeah, stopping and eating them mid-ride is just delightful and sort of really helps to get you back home again. I mean, you got me excited to want to come bike in East <laughs> Africa. Honestly, all these yeah, stories, definitely. all this, uh, all this experience, and all this—you know—all the dreaming of what's to come, of what's ahead, and in the potential. It's so exciting, and so I love talking yeah. to folks who are seeing that and working towards putting their knowledge and experience to use in a place that maybe hasn't seen it. is is really exciting, and so. Yep. Um, yep. gosh, I'd love to, I'd love to join at some point and love to hear how it goes. I know the, the migration's coming up in, in the next, honestly, soon four four or so months yeah, from now. It is soon. Yep. You know, wh wh where can folks find more about what you're doing and about cycling in East Africa and just, uh, you know, maybe get involved somehow. Where can they, where can they get in touch? 
Yeah, for sure. So Instagram is the most current at the moment. So that's at Migration Gravel Race, essentially all one word. Um, the website will be up very soon, and that will be www.migrationgravelrace.com. Um, but that won't be out for a week or two. But hopefully by the time people listen to this and, and, and get around to searching for it, it will be there. Uh, Facebook is the same, at Migration Gravel Race. Um, and I suppose, yeah, and then on those uh, social media platforms, there'll be email addresses and phone numbers um, for the organisers. Um, and then other links would be um, at Kenyan underscore riders is the the cycling team Instagram page. And then my own one is at cycle underscore East Africa. And that was, or hopefully still will become um, sort of a a bike tourism, bike tour company doing gravel, uh, bike trip, um, bike packing and sort of enduro and cross country events in a lot of different parts of Kenya and We've got yeah, like endless GPX files that we've slowly put together, and uh, myself and and then Savage Wilderness again. That's uh, at Savage Wilderness on Instagram. Uh, myself and James are working on a lot of different tours. There's a, a seriously beautiful conservancy, um, not too far actually from Mount Kenya, uh, called Barana. Um, and that's I've never seen so many animals in one place in my life. Um, but I just think Barana is <laughs> it just blows me away. And the animals I saw, because there was no <laughs> there was there was no security put out on those days. There was no chopper in the sky. There was no wardens or, or rangers in the bush. And so it was just me and a friend or two just riding around. Sometimes we had a, a four wheel drive. We would meet at different locations to make sure we're okay and a bit of extra water. And, but man, you had to have your eyes open. That was. Uh, it's like holy smokes! They're like those real animals that are like those big ones, those dangerous ones. They're like just there. And uh, there was I've come pretty close to elephant, buffalo, the two that I'm the most concerned about. The cats. A lot of guys that run these conservancies don't seem to be too bothered about cats. Um, and I'm still not convinced yet, even after many years. But I'm just like, man, if I came flying down a hill on my mountain bike around some single track around a bush and there was a lion or a pride of lions sitting there, I would not be happy. But these guys are just like, no, 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 it's it's the elephant, if you know, a rogue elephant, and or if you get a bunch of buffalo and especially the, you know, the alpha males that are in that group, then you're in serious trouble. So but um but yeah, you've just got to be really just be sensible, keep your eyes open and um so it's just yeah, there's so many different areas to ride in. Um guys have been riding off Mount Kenya a little bit. And it's it's good, but it's not the best. It's um like I try and tell friends, you know, if you would go to Nepal on a mountain bike trip, yes, it'd be good fun to ride off Mount Everest, but it's not the best mountain biking in Nepal. Right. And I think Mount Kenya is the same. Like, yeah, you're cool. It sounds great when you stick it on Instagram and blah blah. I rode Mount Kenya, but I think there's other parts of Kenya that are just yeah way more stunning. Even close to Nairobi, like Kajabi, is phenomenal. There's some some really good riding, so you don't have to go too far. But then there's the whole rest of the country. If there's mountains, then yeah, there's some some good riding. So great. Mm-hmm. Well, Simon, man, I'm out of time, but I really appreciate you joining us on the Adventure yeah, Sports Podcast, so much. and I'll stay in touch uh, as the show as it's coming out. And uh, yeah, I yep. really appreciate you just jumping on and telling us about about cycling in East Africa. Sounds awesome. Yeah, fantastic, and and thanks so much, Mason, just for the opportunity to to let me yeah essentially tell the story and let the world know that there is some amazing stuff happening in in East Africa right now, and it is a beautiful place to ride your bike. And um, so, if you've ever wanted to go on a holiday, visit Africa, see the animals, then do it on a bike. It's way better than sitting in a car. <laughs> Absolutely, I'd have to agree. Yeah, and I think. Uh, yeah, hopefully a lot of people are getting itchy feet and they just want to get out once this, once the world is allowed to travel again. Absolutely. Well, Simon, have a great day. I know it's still early yep. for you, but I uh, hope you got some That's time right. to exercise or stretch or whatever you're doing. <laughs> and we'll be uh, we'll be in touch soon, man. Thank you. Yep. Cool, mate. Thanks, All Mason. Right. Have we'll a great speak day. To you later. All right. Bye. 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 
First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.